to you, my dear students. I'm Sean Xavier Alquilita, and we are now at the chapter 6, lesson 2 of our ethics subject entitled Political Doctrines. So before we start, please don't forget to like and subscribe to my YouTube page. Our first topic for political doctrine um, is an egalitarianism. So egalitarianism is a trend of thought in political philosophy. So an egalitarian favors equality of some sort. People should get the same or be treated the same or be treated as equals in some respects. Okay, so let's proceed now for uh, more on egalitarianism. So um, let's take in an alternative view here. So in an alternative view expands on this last mentioned option. People should be treated as equals, should be treated one another as equals, should relate as equals, or enjoy an equality of some status of some sort. Um, so egalitarian doctrines tend to rest on a background that all human persons are equal in fundamental worth or moral status. So far as the Western Europe and Anglo-American philosophical tradition is concerned, one significant source of this, of this thought is the Christian notion that God loves all human souls equally. So here, egalitarianism is a protean doctrine because there are several different types of equality or ways in which people might be treated the same or might relate as equals that might be thought desirable. In modern democratic societies, the term egalitarian is often used to refer to a position that favors for any of a wide array of reasons, a greater degree of equality of income and wealth across persons than currently exists. So as a view within political philosophy, uh, egalitarianism has to do both with how people are treated and with distributive justice. Civil rights movements reject certain types of social and political discrimination and demand that people be treated equally. So distributive justice is another form of egalitarianism that addresses life outcomes and the allocation of valuable things such as income, wealth, and other goods. Okay, for egalitarianism, to judge two things equal, we must also specify the relevant qualities they have in common. Okay, so therefore, egalitarianism is the belief that all humans share the essence or quality that makes them equal, although all egalitarians believe in equality. They often differ in their understanding of the qualities all humans share. So every form of egalitarianism is a cosmopolitan and inclusive. Those who see only members of their own group as equal and not egalitarian because egalitarianism is always based on a theory of a human commonality and because of the universe, universal human qualities are difficult to define. Their essence is often unspecified by egalitarian thinkers. Nonetheless, anyone who believes all humans are equal must also believe all humans have some kind of essence or quality in common because without commonality there can be no equality. So this term is derived from the French word egal or eagle which means equal or at the same level and was first used in English in 1880s 
although the equivalent term equalitarian dates from the late 18th century. Okay, so here are the types of egalitarianism. The first one is economic egalitarianism or material egalitarianism. So, to define it, it is where the participants of a society are of equal standing and have equal access to all economic resources in terms of economic power, wealth, and contribution. It is a founding principle of various forms of socialism. Uh, more, moreover, uh, in communism. Another one is moral egalitarianism. It is a position that equality is central to justice, that all individuals are entitled to equal respect, and that all human persons are equal in fundamental worth or moral status. The second, uh, the third one is a legal egalitarianism. So it's the principle under which each individual is subject to the same law, so no one is above the law. Okay? with no individual or group or class having special legal privileges and where the testimony of all persons is counted with the same weight. The fourth one is political egalitarianism. is where the members of a society are of equal, in stand, uh, equal standing in terms of political power or influence it is a founding principle of most forms of democracy. Okay. The fifth one is luck egalitarianism. So luck egalitarianism is a view about distributive justice. So when you say distributive justice, what is just or right with respect to the allocation of goods in a society? Espoused by a variety of left-wing political philosophers. So this one here. Um, egalitarian uh, luck egalitarianism is espoused by a variety of left-wing political thinkers which seeks to distinguish between outcomes that are the result of brute luck for example misfortunes in genetic makeup or being struck by a bolt of lightning and those that there are consequence of conscious options like career choices or even fear gambles Okay. The next one is gender egalitarianism or zygarchy. So it, it is a form of society in which power is equally shared between men and women or a family structure where power is shared equally by both parents. The next one is Racial egalitarianism. It is the absence of ra racial segregation and racial discrimination. No? Because every race is equal. Mm. Regardless of your color, we're just the same. All of us are just the same. So when you say racial segregation, it is the separation of different racial groups in daily life, whether mandated by law or through social norms. The next one is what we call it as the opportunity egalitarianism or asset-based egalitarianism. It is the idea that equality is possible by a redistribution of resources, usually in the form of a, in the form of a capital grant provided at the same age of majority, an idea that has been around since Thomas Paine in the year 7 uh, in the 17th or 18th, 18th century. The last one is the Christian egalitarianism holds that all people are equal before God and in Christ and specifically teaches gender equality in Christian church leadership and in marriage. Okay, for our next topic will be communism, and, uh, socialism and communism. So let's go now to the, um, here in this topic, we'll do, uh, 
um, I will discuss what is communism or what is socialism, the idea of Karl Marx no? uh, with regards to his uh, economic and philosophical as uh, uh, political philosophy behind the principle of socialism and and how uh, does Joe Massison's being um, uh, shall I say uh, Joe Massison was influenced by this idea of socialism and communism so I will also include the issues the present issues that is prevailing today especially on the red tagging issue that is uh, prevalent in our philippine society today in so far as socialism and communism is concerned okay so let's go over for the um for the background of karl marx so actually karl marx is the one that espouses uh, socialism and communism and that is based on his book uh, books like Das Kapital or The Capital so his critique on capitalism uh, moreover uh, in his economic and philosophic manuscripts so where he uh, discuss the historical materialism no? and I will uh, I will elaborate the historical materialism later in which he himself, Karl Marx, along with Friedrich Engels, both these two people authored the book, The Communist Manifesto. And this is the book uh, written by both of them for the masses. no? And that is why for uh, of all the philosophers, Karl Marx is so very easy to read because his books are pang masa. No? Uh, his books are written for the people, even for the poor ones to read. And another thing here is that Karl Marx also wrote the book, The Critique of Gotha Program. Okay, so let's move further about the definition of socialism and communism. Okay, so let's proceed with the idea about socialism and communism. And for Karl Marx, socialism and communism are just an, uh, interchangeable ideas, no? are just the same idea. So socialism is a populist economic and political system based on the public ownership. So when you say public ownership, also known as collective or common ownership of the means of production. Those means include the machinery, tools, factories used to produce goods that aim uh, to directly satisfy human needs so in other words socialism or communism is defined as a total abolition of private property as defined by Karl Marx in his book uh, the communist manifesto so um, everything that you own all your privacy and every even your private property is owned by the state and for this one everyone shall be given a everyone should be given a property in according to his ability according to his contribution so everyone in the society receives a share of production based on how much each has contributed so that is why for Karl Marx Karl Marx says a specter is hunting Europe the specter of communism that was the one of the first um, statements in the book um, this in his book the communist manifesto so what does it mean here the specter is hunting Europe the specter of communism because for Karl Marx history undergoes a uh, history is always the history of class struggle and that is what we mean by here Okay, so let's proceed okay so who are those philosophers who influenced Marx or Karl Marx number one is Ludwig Feuerbach Ludwig Feuerbach is an atheist that is why um, Karl Marx uh, Karl Marx view about religion or God is that God 
or religion is an opium of the people. What does it mean, religion is an opium of the people? Because for Karl Marx, there are some people, especially the bourgeois or the rich ones, uses religion as a means to oppress the poor. And based on this idea, Ludwig Feuerbach also also thought here uh, that my only wish is to transform friends of God into friends of man, believers into thinkers, devotees of prayer into devotees of work, candidates for the hereafter into the students of the world. So Christians who, by their own admission, are half animal, half angel, into persons, into whole persons. That is why we are reduced, in this idea, we are reduced from our transcendence, from our transcendence, from the nature of our transcendence, going down to the material level. That man is just only a material being. So it is as clear as the sun and as evident as a day that there is no God and there can be None. That is why Ludwig Feuerbach is an atheist. The second one here is uh, the second philosopher influenced Karl Marx was Jörg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, or just simply says Hegel, in his Phenomenology of Spirit that Hegel proposes his own logical idea about the dialectics, no? The dialectics of the thesis um, contradicted by the antithesis in order to produce a synthesis. And from there, a synthesis negated or opposed by an antithesis or antithesis to arrive at another synthesis. And the synthesis will be another thesis which is also opposed by antithesis to produce another synthesis and so on and so forth until you arrive at an absolute idea or you can arrive at an absolute truth because for Hegel truth is the whole is entire and moreover in, a, in analysis of the history for Hegel's philosophy of history in order for you to see the history you must see the whole no? that is why um, you can arrive the absolute idea based on uh, taking the whole to see the whole the whole the whole of the picture so that is what Hegel is trying to say here the absolute idea as well as the absolute spirit Okay. Okay. So what Marx was trying to do here is just he turned Hegel's philosophy upside down. So here Instead of focusing on the absolute spirit, Karl Marx instead focused on the material world. That is why he said that the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. That is why he used the Hegel's philosophy in order to understand the idea of the classless society, which is communism, using the dialectic. No? That is why for, for in Marx's philosophy, he uses the material dialect, uh, dialectical materialism here. So uh, I will elaborate this one later on the, um, on the relations of production as well as historical materialism. Okay, so this is now the historical materialism. So let us try to see first the Marxist idea about man. So man is basically all of us, 
um, since the, we're talking here about materialism, okay, man has basic needs. We need food. We need uh, food, um, shelter, clothing, education. Um, what else? Medicine in uh, for our own needs. These are our basic needs. And in order to to uh, to acquire those needs, we need to work for them. So our labor. The definition of Marxist view about labor that we labor for our own selves. We labor for my own. Anything that I work for is for my own. Is for my own. No, the products or the things that I produce should should only be for my own interest. But the problem here is that that when I work. There is somebody who is higher than me, the boss. So instead that I'm working for my own, I'm working for his company and I'm working for his interest. And this is where the classless, uh, no, no, not classless, sorry. But this is where the starting point of the class struggle here. Because instead of working for my own, I'm already working for someone who is higher than me. And I'm working for his own interest. I am working for his company. Okay? This is where man, for example, I myself as a worker, this is where the alienation of labor, alienation of man, alienation of nature, as well as alienation of labor comes in. No? So because by nature, man is, uh, for according to Marx, by, by nature we work only for ourselves and not for someone who is higher than me but it turned out that in the reality I'm I'm working for someone is higher than me okay and this is where the alienation comes in okay Okay, so let's pr proceed here. Now, since, so we're talking here the modes of production and the relations of production, no? Um, since that, I am not now working for myself. This is where alienation comes in. But always remember, class, that here in Karl Marx's philosophy, that the material things that I produce, for example, as a teacher, uh, I have my pen, I have my pen, I have my class record, I have the textbook, for example, textbook, as the mere extensions of my own being, as being human. That is why we consider it as a materialism, because the material things that I that I produce as a teacher, the material things that I use as a teacher are the mere extensions of my own self. But the problem here is that in the reality, I'm not working for myself. I'm working for the production, for the interest of the company that I'm working. So here, this is where the alienation of labor and alienation of humanity comes in. No? Alienation. When you say alienation, you're not now in your in your own state of nature. You're alienated. Oh. Parang hindi ka na ginawang tao. You're not treated as humans in this idea. No? So, uh, from here Marx develops the idea about the class struggle that in the history, there are two struggles. There are already a class struggle between the higher class, which is the company that I'm working, and the lower class, me, for example, as, a, as an employee. So, a lower class. Upper class and the lower class. So, here, this is where I could be able to go deeper now into the historical 
uh, historical materialism of Karl Marx. Okay, so here, on the lower right, you can see here the historical materialism. Okay, using the dialectics of Hegel, Hegelian dialectics, so history started with the primitive communism where all people shared the same where the cavemen uh, the, the people during the ancient times the cavemen were treated as equals mm. um, shared the same shared the same food shared the same modes of production but however if someone if someone holds the means of production other than the other this is where the the second stage of history to develop that is why that synthesis here is what we call it the slave epoch or the slave uh, slave uh, slavery no now in the slave epoch the master shares or owns the entire means of production even owning a slave uh, by owning a slave he can purchase a slave or even he can sell a slave but is a sl if the slave owns a little bit of the means of production just like the tools for his work this is where the next phase um, the next phase of history no to arise and this is what we call that feudalism the new thesis the feudal epoch where the upper class or the the upper class were the feudal lords and the lower class were the tenants no uh, this is um, actually this feudalism is very common in the haciendas no so, mga haciendero now and if these people working for the feudal lords um, uh, owns a little bit no the means of production or uh, if they can already enjoy the benefits of being a worker now it will yield to another phase of histo history or his a historical epoch and that is capitalism and this is where the reality that we are living here today we are here now in, in a capitalistic society we're in we're working for the company we're working for the billionaires now in the capitalism the higher class are known as the bourgeois the bourgeoisie and the lower class are the proletariats no now what is the the notion here that if that we are we're, we're working now for the bourgeois now if you realize that your that your being as a person as a worker or as an employee um, um, if the rich will become richer because of the idea of alienation if the rich will become richer and the poor will become poorer it will yield to uh, the revolution against the bourgeois so these people belonging to the lower class will launch a great revolution against the bourgeois so that it will yield to another phase of historical materialism mona, uh, through violent upheaval and that is what we call it as socialism or eventually communism as the synthesis and for Karl Marx that is the end of the history the end of dialectical change because in communism if the proletariats will successfully overthrow the bourgeois so they will create a classless society wherein people will be ab our where people are deprived of their private property and even their privacy 
for the for the good of the entire society for the good of all so you need to sacrifice your civil right no your human right of privacy as well as your human right to property for the sake of common good and that is the for Karl Marx this um, idea of communism uh, political philosophy of communism this is what we call it as a utopian society utopia this is an ideal society but if you apply this into the reality it is very difficult why it's because people uh, using the philosophy of uh, Thomas uh, no using the philosophy of Hobbes that all of all of us are are um, are driven by self-interest but who are those people in a in a communistic or socialist countries who are those people who are who sit in the government in the socialist government are those the people who belong to the bourgeois and that's the that's the problem here even Joe Masison who is now in Netherlands he enjoys so much a virtual life in the Netherlands um, at the expense of those people the NPAs who are striving struggling for their lives struggling in their lives in the countryside sabuki in the boondocks in the countryside with lack of water food shortage um, and even for the harmful mosquitoes and then at the risk of by uh, to be killed by the military no and and their leader is a uh, living a virtual life in netherlands enjoys 400 million pesos per year received by the revolutionary tax given by their cadres no that's the problem here in communism okay so this is now for marx this the essential driving force of history of dialectical materialism is the contradiction between classes so history will progress through five epochs before reaching the ultimate goal of communism okay so what are the advantages of socialism and or communism so workers are no longer exploited since they own the means of production so all profits are spread equitably among all workers according to his or her contribution the cooperative system realizes that um, even those who cannot work must have their basic needs met for the good of the whole the next one is the system eliminates poverty so everyone has an equal access to health care and education no one is discriminated against another one here is that everyone works at what one is best and one what one enjoys you know if society needs jobs to be done that no one wants it offers higher compensation to make it worthwhile another one here is that natural resources are preserved for the good of the whole okay next one what are the disadvantages of socialism or communism the first one so the biggest disadvantage of socialism is that it relies on the cooperative nature of humans to work it negates those within society who are competitive and not cooperative so competitive people tend to seek ways to overthrow society for their own gain so here it does not reward people for being entrepreneurial and competitive as such it won't be as innovative as a capitalistic society 
Okay, next one is the government set up to represent the masses may abuse its position and claim power for itself. Another one, it tries to abolish religion. Why? It's because for Karl Marx, religion is an opium of the people. So in a communistic or socialist society, you have no freedom of religion. Mm. Even in the uh, even in the Communist Party of the Philippines Constitution, as I read it, I read the Constitution of the CPP, Communist Party of the Philippines. Um, you have no freedom of religion. I'm so sorry to tell you that. So under Marxism, you would have the freedom freedom to have your own faith. But you would not have the freedom to practice it in a way that is organized. As you can see, religion would ultimately place one group in a superior role over the others, which goes against the equality in the principle of Marxism. This means that there would be no organized religion which would affect the prominent beliefs followed around the world including Christianity and Judaism as Marx felt that religion was used to control people that is why as I've told you religion is an opium of the people Marxism would not allow people to be free of choosing their spirituality the next one is it negatively affects educational system Okay, it is true no, that communism affects the educational system. It is important to note that Marxist education implements one that is absolutely state-controlled, one-party control, which means that it regards too much importance to the role of state in education, which means that the methodology of teaching curriculum construction and examination system would be determined by the state and it does not allow other agencies in education both local or regional to have their say marxist philosophy in education sees economics lying at the root of every human activity through this uh, it's not absolutely factual or scientific point of view as economics occupies the pivotal position in the curriculum is one of the main objectives to acquire productive skills which would result to creative faculties of children being neglected but in the Philippines in the CPP in a Communist Party of the Philippines uh, the education is much more on training uh, these children to become rebels no uh, to uh, to re to rebel against the government and moreover, uh, one of the communist schools that I've that I've list uh, is an Al Kadev, no, which is in Surigao, an Al Kadev school. Uh, that school was not recognized by the by the DepEd Department of Education, but that is that school is a ground, is a breeding ground of education for the uh, for the people to become a member of the NPA, the uh, New People's Army okay next it does not value the concept of private ownership that is why it's a total abolition of private ownership so while you are given a place to live as a part of community and contribute to the common good you will have no private property private ownership which means that you might not have much control over your residence and your contributions okay so let's proceed it limits opportunities for entrepreneurs if you're in the doing business under Marxism then basically you would be working for the government which means that are not going to work as an entrepreneur freelancer or sole business owner okay and of course it leads to communism it's a possible occurrence in Marxism as this philosophy is believed to lead dictatorship that is why it leads to dictatorship the best example is the North Korea you know, where people are not free you're not, free, you're not allowed to go out so if you try to go out from the country you'll be, you'll be shot, shot to death you no? Know? okay 
As you can see, it would not allow anyone to be individual, which is believed to lead to a dangerous society without anybody being motivated. In theory, equally sounds great. That is why, as I told you, it's a utopian society. So, seeing a lot of examples where people are treated fairly, but keep in mind that an individual is taken out of the scenario under Marxism. Okay? The strengths and weaknesses of this philosophy show some sets of benefits and drawbacks, creating a system of government that is prone to abuse. That is why Marx to fix its flaws by examining its strengths and weaknesses we will be able to decide whether it is best for society or not uh, senator de la rosa has locked down temporarily and uh, there were questions that he would want to post to post uh, Ka Eric and uh, his companion. Uh, uh, now, related to that, I also have a question for uh, the intelligence community, sana kila General Monteagudo. But mas mabuti kay Ka Eric na itanong na sa mga natin naririto sila para maiwasan natin mo na yung problema sa budget. Um, recently, there was a 17-year-old member, child warrior, ng CPP and PA, who filed a rape complaint against their former commander. Sa mga pagkakalam nyo, sa tagal ninyo doon, um, ganong kabata ba yung mga nagiging uh, recruit? Magandang, magandang araw po. Sir, um, Senator President, and uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Ping Lakson. Ako po si Jeffrey Selis. Uh, ka Eric po ang gamit. Jeffrey Selis, pero ka Eric ang tawag sa'yo. Ka Eric po ang pangalan. Ang, ang, ang code ako, marami po kaming ginagamit na code. I will try to address directly first the question, and I will request the good senators to, to qualify some of my answers. Yung recruitment po ng kabataan sa CPP and PNDF, in my experience based on doctrine, practice and experience. Nagsisimula po yan kung mga sa baryo ng mga kabataan, meaning sa rural areas, maaga po talaga, Senator, uh, Senate President, Sir. Kasi ang mga pamilya ng mga kabataan na ito na tinatawag naming mass base, yung mga bata mismo as early as 8, 7, 6, before 10, kahalubilo po sila ng NPA. Eh. So, kaya nga sabi ko, ipokrito kami sa CPP, NPA, and DEF to assert international humanitarian law, samantala mga granada at armas namin sa loob mismo ng bahay ng masa. At uh, kami ay nag assert ng CARIL, Comprehensive Agreement for the Respect of Human Rights and International Humanitarian Law, signed during the time of President Estrada. Pero hindi namin sinasabi na ang aming mga granada at armas, natutulog kami mismo sa bahay ng masa. Pero pag sundalo at pulis, bawal matulog sa bahay ng civilian, sa chapel at sa mga schools. Dihado talaga sila sa amin. Kasi kami, we do not tie down our rules sa IHL. We only use the IHL and other humanitarian conventions and protocols of war when it is convenient for us. Halimbawa, landmine. Ayaw naming tawagin yan, Senator, when you were search PNP as IED. Gusto naming tawagin yan na CDX, Command Detonated Explosives. Because under the Ottawa Convention and the Geneva Convention Protocol 1 and 2, gray area yan. Ang ipinagbabawal ay Ang command detonated, uh, sorry, ang pressure detonated and automatic and time bound. But the pressure detonated or the command detonated na may switch gamit ang blasting cap at detonating cord, hindi siya outright na ipinagbabawal clearly sa Ottawa Convention and conventions ng Geneva Convention. So naikuta namin Senator uh, Soto Sir and uh, Senator Ping. Sa tanong niyo po, paano na i-involve ang kabataan? Two ways. Kung sa baryo po, Kahit hindi sila recruited dahil masa sila, mas base area yon. doon mismo kami nakatira. Doon kami mismo nag-organize, kasama namin ang mga magulang nila. So the children are exposed to the horrors and dangers of war. Informal recruitment. Dalawang recruitment kasi ang kabataan, Senator Soto, sorry. Sa schools and universities, urban areas. And then the other side of recruitment sa mga barrio. Kapag schools, 
and universities po, ang recruitment ay nagsisimula usually, sir, minor ka pa niyan eh. When I was recruited in the West Visayas State University, I was about to turn 18. Ang malala ngayon, nakita ko in the last 10 years. Pa Papunta sana ako ng tanong dyan eh. Pa Paano ka na-recruit? Saan ka nag-umbisa? Ano nangyari? Okay, thank you, Senator Soto, sir. Na-recruit po ako sa West Visayas State University. It is a premier state university sa Iloilo City. In 1991. Ang unang organization na na-recruit ay nag-recruit sa akin. Sino nag sa'yo? Namatay po siya. Pinatay siya sa loob ng bus noong March 2019 last year, NDF consultant siya. Ang pangalan niya po ay Randy Felix Malayaw. He is also a good writer, just uh, pareho kami, mga college editors, Guild. Uh, he was arrested before on the case pertaining to the assassination of Congressman Rodolfo Aguinaldo. He was from Isabela. And uh, <clears throat> he, at the time of his death, nasa underground pa siya. Ako ay nagtumutulong na security consultant to the government. Pero ang pag-recruit sa akin, I was not recruited directly to the CPP. Kaya natutuwa ako na nakikinig ako sa mga officials ngayon and the senators discussing things which are never known to public, even to the government themselves, especially the military, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, Sir, uh, Senator Soto, Sir. I mean, akala ko ang aming pagsama uh, sa aktivismo sa College Editors Guild of the Philippines which is an open organization, ay laban lamang sa U.S. military bases. Kasi mainit ang talakayan noon sa pagpapata. The abrogation of the U.S. military bases, 91 ako na-recruit. Eh. 1991. Oo, so kasagsagan ng debate sa U.S. military bases, transition from Cory government to Ramos government. So nang ma-recruit ako sa CGP, tuwang po ako kasi these are things that I never learned in school. Ito mga itinuturo sa amin. But three months thereafter, Senator, uh, Mr. Chair, in-invite ako nila Randy Felix Malayaw pagpalain sa ng kanyang kaluluwa. At na, hindi ko muna pangalanan yung ibang nag-invite kasi active pa po sa media. Mataas na rin ang katungkulan. We were students nung panahon na yun. Nang ma-recruit pa ako sa CGP, I was thinking, yun ay yung pagiging aktivista. But three months into the recruitment, uh, at least nakikinig ang buong bayan, ang buong bansa, mga nanay na nakikinig at kabataan. In-invite ako sa isang meeting sa boarding house, mga 12 kami. At sa meeting na yon mga student editors, campus writers, at student leaders ang nandun, iba't ibang universities. Pagdating doon, hindi na pinag-aralan ang U.S. military bases. Pinag-aralan namin ang libro ni Joe Masison. Wala pang, M wala pang MKLRP noon. Ang tawag pa noon, LRP. Lipuna na Tribulusyong Pilipino. In English, Philippine Society and Revolution by Amado Guerrero, the nom de guerre of Joe Masison. Yan ang, uh, yan ang Biblia. I can teach that without the book in one day, two days, three days, depending sa audience. And until now, memory, memoriado ko yung apat na portion. First part is national situation. Mayaman ang Pilipinas, kung ito naghihirap ang sambay ng Pilipino. Second part, history. Ang kasaysayan ng pananakop at paglaban ng sambay ng Pilipino. Third part, tatlong ismo. Imperialismo, burokrata kapitalismo, feudalismo, tatlong salot ng lipunan. Yung fourth part ang pinakadelikado. DRB. Demokratikong revolusyong bayan ang tanging solusyon sa problema ng mamamayan. Dito ang radicalization. Akala ko, yun na yun. Manunumpa pala kami sa bandilang pula. Yellow ang nakalagay, triangle. May alibata siya. Alibata, everyone knows, is an ancient Filipino alphabet. Sir, President, anong organization ang pinasasapian mo nun bago ka na-recruit? Uh, si Wala, sir. I, I, I'm an ordinary, I was an ordinary student, Mr. Chair. I was a writer. I was part of the editorial board of Forum Dimensions. And I was recruited to the CGP advocating for mga issues ng mamamayan. Pero nang manumpa po ako after that LRP session in a boarding house, tago na meeting yun, tago. We were, we were told that it was a CGP meeting, but it was not. It was not a CGP, CGP meeting. It was a meeting of Kabataang Makabayan, KM. KM was the organization founded by Joe Masison in 1964, November 30, when he was still part of the old PKP, Lumang Partido Komunista ng Pilipinas, sa panahon nila, Jose Jesus Vicente Laba. Joma was part of that. Joma is not the original CPP founder. The original CPP was in November 7, 1930, founded by Crisanto Evangelista. Every party member knows this, and the rest of the Makabayan Black knows this. Yes, they are party members. We are the same. Sa tanong ni, ni Mr. Chair, Mr. Soto, 
paano ko napunta sa CPP? KM is the first step to the CPP. From CEGP, you will not be recruited from open organizations direct to the CPP. There is no direct recruitment to the Communist Party. The recruitment will pass open organizations and then underground and then party. The underground is the consolidator for the armed struggle. It is the NDF. So the NDF is not innocent. It is a conspirator, enabler, collaborator of armed struggle. It is not a legitimate organization pretending to be legal, but rather it is an underground umbrella of all sectoral underground organizations, Senator, uh, Mr. Chair, like Kabatang Makabayan. In December of 91, I was again recruited, Mr. President and uh, Mr. Chair, I was again recruited to become candidate member of the Communist Party of the Philippines. Ako po'y dalawang beses na nanumpa sa CPP. 91 of December and May of 92. Kasi ang unang recruitment mo from the underground will be candidate member. No voting right ka sa loob ng partido. Pagka full member ka na prove na nila na hindi ka security threat at capable ka to be developed as a cadre, you will be recruited to become a full member. At doon ka i-recruit talaga at bibigyan ng pag-aaral. Sa panahon namin ha, uh, kasama po yan sa summer immersion, I was recruited in the area of Ibaras, Iloilo. With uh, no less than uh, yung mga regional party committee ng mga matatanda ng mga 70s ang nakita ko, sila mga instructor ko sa BKP, Batayang Kursong Ay, Pang Party. Napanggit mo kanina yung CEGP, College Editors Guild, di ba? Yes, sir. Miembro ka nito. Yun ang unang organization na sinalihan na, ko. Na sinalihan mo. Yes. So, yun ang naging vehicle kung paano ka naispatan na ma-recruit. Because ang nagre-recruit at namumuno ng CGP are already cadre of okay. the CPP. Sige, please proceed. Which hindi nila ina-admit sa amin. We were thinking na pariho-pariho kami mga writers na una pong na-recruit si Randy Felix Malayaw sa akin. If you are asking for the historical reference of my authenticity, ang kapanahonan ko po ay si Teddy Casino. He was the national chair of C national president of CGP. I was the regional chairman of the CGP. Do I know him? also to be, to be part of the CPP. Hindi na po ako magpapakaipokrito, Mr. Chair, Mr. President. Yes. We were all CPP. They are still CPP. They are still part of the Communist Party. And worse, they deny it and they are, not, they are not admitting it to the nation. That is why they are not here. I was supposed to meet him them here. Maganda sa nang nandito kami para lahat ng circumstances to be asked by Senate and to be known by the people ay masasagot. Mr. Chair, we are, I operated po sa dalawang mundo ng CPP na hindi po ito masyadong naiintindihan. From 91 to 2001, uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Ping, involved ko sa history ko. Ikaw po ang Chief PNP. Yun ang huli ko pong bahagi sa open mass movement ng pinatalsik namin si Pangulong Estrada. We organized, conspired, collaborated in a broad alliance to establish the era of resign movement. It is a known fact. It is part of history. It was a collaboration of the Communist Party, of the church leaders, of traditional opposition politicians na hinayaan ni Pangulong Estrada. At iyan po ay naging bahagi ako. I was a regional coordinator of ERA Resign Movement. Nakikinig po sila ngayon, papatayin nila ako sa lahat ng mga isinisiwalat ko. Hindi po pupuno ang buong araw natin sa lahat ng historical accounts ko na ito. Yung inaalala ko, mukhang sa history mo, mabutin tayo maghapon. So, pass forward muna tayo doon sa main question ko kanina. Dahil may 17 years old na child, former child warrior na, na kinasuhan ng rape yung commander niya. Ngayon, ang tanong ko, is this something that happens or that happened before? Ito ba yung mga uh, this kind of abuses and human rights uh, violations uh, done to the recruits, ah. or their commanders or leaders or the terrorist groups? Nangyayari ba ito or isolated itong kaso ito? Uh, Mr. Senate President and uh, Mr. Chair, nangyayari po yan. Sabi ko nga, anong tatag mo sa Marxismo, Leninismo at Mawismo pag tinamaan ka ng prinsipyo ni Freud ng libido, malilimutan mo ang disiplina ng Marxismo, Leninismo at Mawismo. I, I confirm the uh, question of the Senate President. Nakaabuso ba mga kapatahan sa babayihan? Ni, yes. uh, former Congressman Colmenares, ang request niya kung pwedeng yung mga resource persons na mag-aakusa dapat ito may personal knowledge. Tatanungin kita ngayon, meron ka bang personal knowledge sa alinmang pangyayari na pinabanggit mo? Ang, ang testimonya ko po ay meron akong personal knowledge. 
And to Mr. Chair, with your with your uh, indulgence, I would like to address also Mr. Nere Colmenares, my former comrade in the CPP. The personal knowledge required is only in the court of law, sa trial sa court. Kaya ayaw nyo kami humarap sa Senado at lumabas sa media kami mga kasama nyo because malalantad kayo. And in the court of law, of law in the judicial requirement, Mr. Senator, required kami doon na mag-produce on the weight of evidence based on the rules of evidence ng korte. Yun ang gusto nila. Itatali ang kamay namin. Sa tanong ni Mr. Chair, Senate President, we have, do we have enough knowledge of the things that we want to testify before the people in the Senate? Yes, we have. Uh, depende po sa itatanong nyo at ibibigay nyo yung panahon. Sasagutin ko lang po, Mr. Chair, Senate President, ang tinanong nyo. Oh, kung uh, nangyayari ito before, hanggang ngayon nangyayari ba ito? Nangyayari po yan, uh, Mr. Senate President, matagal na. Uh, although, in fairness to the NPA, kapag ikaw ay nahuli na, na ng rape, pinapatay ka namin, uh, that is death sentence. That is automatic death sentence. Pero dahil uh, yung ibang nagkukumit ng rape and abuse sa mga miyembro na NPA na kababaihan, lalo na kabataan, ay mga matataas ang katungkulan sa partido at sa NPA, Mr. Senate President, pwedeng itago po yan. At yan ang nangyari sa dalawang bata na magkakapatid sa late ngayon. Ilang taon silang inabuso. And I am not at liberty to discuss that kasi right at the halls of Congress, right of Senate right now, siya po ay naging biktima din. But bak baka sensitive yan. Hindi ko alam kung sa television tayo. If you want direct testimony for that, nandito rin siya sa Senate ngayon. NPA siya. Kabataan siya ng ma-recruit. At uh, tanungin niyo siya po mamaya. I, I, I think baka isuspend natin ang, uh, ang coverage or rules sa executive session kung anong detalye. Pero sa sagot sa tanong ni Senate President, yes. The abuse... And the, the vulnerability of children and uh, mga minor na NPA na nare-recruit, nangyayari, nangyayari po. Ang, ang kinababahala po, Mr. Senate President and Mr. Chair, in the last eight years, on the recovered document from Vic Ladlad, the Acting Secretary General of the Communist Party, nang mahuli siya sa Novaleches, proud na proud sila that they were able to recruit in three years ng walong libong kabataan muli in the underground movement at ang mostly senior high school from PUP, UST, FEU. Ito yung umiyak dito sa Senado. They were not trying ladies for nothing. They were grieving mothers like our mothers na umiiyak ng kami naglayas at nag-full time sa NPA during our time. Nangyayari po ito ngayon, dokumento ito ng CPP NPA. In the last three years, 2016, 17, and 18, hanggang 19, more than 8,000 na kabataan, senators, Mr. Chair and, and uh, Senate President, ang recruit nila from the, from the document mismo ni Vic Ladlad, nakuha ito at ang karamihan senior high school, which means 16 and 17 years old. And I share the concern of the Senate President right now. Yes, um, it is really uh, alarming uh, na nangyayari nga pala, ba, pala ito. Ngayon, uh, ilang taon na po ba kayo? If you don't mind, may ask him. Ako po'y pinanganak noong October 14, 1971. Libra pong so Jack Sain ko po'y 49 years old. 1971. Medyo bata ka pa. Hindi ka... Uh, Kabirthday ko po si uh, Mr. Joey De Leon, a very good artist. Ah, okay. Pero kalinya, hindi mo kalinya kami nila Senator Lacson at saka ni Librad, no? Secretary Del. Uh, medyo bata-bata ka pa. So, kasi bigla akong nag-alala at naalala ko rin, parang reminder sa akin, noong araw, Natatandaan ko kasi, pagka hindi ninyo alam, kaming mga edad na ganito naalala namin, na dapat talaga nag-iingat yung ating mga kabataan. Dahil nung araw, may mga beauty queens na sumali sa ano, sumalib eh. Ano, uh, nagbago ang buhay nila eh. No? Uh, kaya dapat sabihan nga talaga na medyo pag-aralan natin mabuti mga kilos natin, lalo sa ating kabataan. Lalo, hindi nyo siguro kilala si Maita Gomez, ano? Si Nelia hindi, Sancho. Hindi ko, Nelia uh, Sancho. Mr. Senate President, hindi ko siya inabutan, but I confirm, they were part of the CTP and PA. Oh, beauty queen. Maita oh. Gomez, si Nelia Sancho. Uh, hindi, yung iba po, mga magaganda talaga. Sa Vic Vicos Tignani ng Negros, magaganda yan eh. Oh. Marami magaganda sa NPA, kaya maganda ang asawa ko po. Kaya nga, may bali, paalala uh, natin. Mr. Yung... Senate President, ikaw ba'y nag-surrender, nahuli? Paano ka ba nakatiwalag? Very different po ang circumstansya ko as Mr. Chair and Senate President, uh, hindi po ako na-captured. Hindi rin po ako uh, arrested kasi wala ako sa warrant of arrest. Pero nasa order of battle ako. 
uh, naglaylo ako, nag-awol ako. Ang last unit ko po from the Era Resign Movement, I was deployed in 2000. Pamulo Quintanar. Hindi na po ako magdidetalye, pero redemption ko po ito ngayon. And I'm, I'm very happy, Mr. Chair, Mr. Senate President, for me to liberate myself, myself, ourselves, from the demons playing in our conscience for the many sins that we have committed to the people. Maraming salamat po, uh, Mr. Chair. Popoy so, Lagman. Sir? Popoy Lagman. Popoy Lagman was never assassinated by the NPA. I will not tell kung sino alam din namin. Pero hindi NPA. Hindi NPA po. Tabara, yes. Sa Fairview, SM uh, Fairview po. Arthur, Arthur Tabara. Yes po. Rolly Quintanar po. Uh, yes, yeah. yeah, si Rolly Abadilla. Yeah, Rolly Quintanar was a major project yeah, of Abadilla. the... Rolly Abadilla. Abadilla. Hindi po sir. Rolando Abadilla. Hindi pa, sir. You will learn a lot from us, sir. Pero ABB. Yeah. ABB. Uh, sir, uh, one minute, Mr. Chair, uh, if I may. I am very happy. We're very happy. Maybe ma marinig din mamaya si Kashane. Mas younger siya sa akin. And uh, she has a lot of testimonies to tell. Baka mas mayayanig mamaya ang marinig mula sa kanya. Ang message ko lang is very clear. Napakagandang pagkakataon po ito upang mag-unite ang buong bayan at ang gobyerno, ang Senado, ang Kongreso, ang Executive and even the Judiciary for us to stand against the CPP and PNDF. Sa tanong, sir, from the perspective of a former cadre, anong kapabilidad ng CPP and PNDF? They cannot overthrow the government, but they can make Smart and Globe pay 200 million more every year combined. Is that not a threat? They can make 300 to 400 million from the NGO racket coming in. I'm inside. telling you that's an open secret. Yeah, correct po. And they can make AAA contractors na gumagawa ng mga airport, ports, mawayad. Again, that's an open secret. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 2% yung cut ng NPA sa mga infra. Naging 3 na ba? Oh. I confirm, sir, 2%. Uh, 2% but in the document, sir, 3.5. Sa lahat ng infra, Walang under, lalo sa mga influence, kung walang 2% from the contractor. That's in addition to the 10% of the congressmen. Agree, sir. At ang source, sir, I will reveal. Not Secretary Villan. Some, some congressmen, by the way. I'd like, I'd like to qualify. Yeah, that. some congressmen. At ang source po ng information namin, Senate, Senate President, Mr. Chair, kung paano namin nalalaman ang mga projects, saan ang location, magkanong cost, sinong project nito, ang manager, DPWH the information on the extortion if there is one single biggest mafia style highly organized most prolific extortion machinery to come before the face of the earth is the cpp and bndf at hindi yan napipigilan ng ating government so the, so paano din it sorry mr senate president curious lang paano nare-remit yan at saan magkano na po oh, magkano ilang porsyento na pupunta sa the netherlands Ilan yung nagagamit dito sa operation dito sa local? Ang sa Smart and Globe po ay bank remittance pero outside the Philippines. Yeah. Ilang percent? Alibaba, sa 300 million per year, ilang porsyento doon o magkano ang napupunta doon sa The Hague? Okay. Ang policy po is pag-regional operations finance. 40% um, i-remit sa Central Committee, 60% sa region. It's 40-60. When you say Central Committee, yung Central Committee dito. Yeah. Ang tinatanong ko, from the 40%, ilang percent yung pumupunta sa Netherlands? Uh, hindi ko po masagot categorical, pero tama po kayo sa inyong uh, uh, very logical questions, Mr. Chair. May napupunta po sa Netherlands kasi nandun ang CPP International Department. Nandun si Joma sa Barrio Utrecht, the Netherlands, sa Barangay Utrecht. At uh, tama po may napupunta doon. At ang napupunta doon, sir, ang naririnig ko na nandun dito pa po hindi po bababa sa 50% ng mga nakikita dito na re-remit doon. So, yun po, that is very clear. At ang pinakamasakit po, the CPP and PNDF are able to circumvent the anti-money laundering council because we are able to establish web network of conduit NGOs that can, that can channel funds amounting to 300 to 400 million coming from uh, partners from Belgium, Netherlands, uh, Europe, etc. With the further intelligence of the Senate President, you so like also. 
do you have a list of the NGOs naging conduit para to circumvent the anti-money laundering law? So the next topic will be the third, the third political doctrine that I'm going to tackle about is the capitalism. Okay, so capitalism is an economic system where private entities owns the factors and the means of production. Four factors are entrepreneurship, capital goods, natural resources, and labor. Owners of capital goods, natural resources, entrepreneurship, exercise control through companies. The individual owns his or her labor. The only exception is slavery, where someone else owns a person's labor. So capitalism is called a free market economy for free enterprise economy, economic system, dominant in the Western world since the breakup of feudalism, in which, in which most of the means of production are privately owned and production is guided and income distributed largely uh, through the operation of markets. Okay, so... What are the characteristics of capitalism? The first one is the two-class system. Historically, a capitalist society was characterized by a split between two classes of individuals, the capitalist class, which owns the means for producing and distributing goods, and the working class, who sell their labor to the capitalist class in exchange for salaries or wages. The economy is run by the individuals or corporations who own and operate through companies and make decisions as to the use of the resources, but there exists a division of labor, which allows for specialization typically occurring through education and training further breaking down into the two class system into two subclasses which is also included here is the middle class okay the second characteristic of capitalism is profit motive so companies exist to make a profit the motive of all companies is to make and sell goods and services only for profits Companies do not exist solely to satisfy people's needs. Even though some goods or services may satisfy needs, they will only be available if the people have the resources to pay for them. The next one is a minimal government intervention. So here, the capitalist societies believe markets should be left alone to operate without the government intervention. However, a completely government-free capitalist society exists in theory only. Even in the United States, the poster child for capitalism, the government regulates certain industries such as the Dodd-Frank Act for Financial Institutions. By contrast, a purely capitalist society would allow the markets to set the prices based on demand and supply for the purpose of making profits. The fourth characteristic of capitalism is competition. True capitalism needs a competitive market. Without competition, monopolies exist. And instead of the market setting prices, the seller is the price setter, which is against the conditions of capitalism. So, willingness to change the last characteristic of capitalism is the ability to adapt and change. Technology has been a game changer in every society. And the willingness to allow change and adaptability of societies 
to improve inefficiencies within economic structures is a true characteristic. Okay, so let's proceed with the advantages of capitalism. So capitalism results in the best products for the best prices. That's true. Consumers will pay more for what they want the most. Businesses provide what customers want at the highest price they'll pay. Prices are kept low by competition among businesses. They make their products as efficient as possible to maximize profit. Most important for economic growth in capitalism's in intrinsic reward for innovation. This includes innovation in the more efficient production methods. It also means innovation of new products. As Steve Jobs said, you cannot just ask customers what they want and then they try to give that to them. But by the time you'll get it to build, they'll want something they want something new. Okay, so what are the disadvantages? Capitalism does not provide for those who lack of competitive skills. This includes the elderly, the children, developmentally uh, disabled caretakers to keep society functioning. Capitalism requires government policies that value the family unit. Okay. So, despite the idea of playing field, capitalism does not promote equality of opportunity. Those without the proper nutrition, support, and education, we may never make it to the playing field. Society may, will never benefit from their valuable skills. So, in short term, inequality may seem to be the best interest of capitalism's winners. They have fewer competitive threats. They may also use their power to rig the system by creating barriers to entry. For example, um, they will donate to elected officials to sponsor laws that benefit their industry. They could send their children to private schools while supporting lower taxes for public schools. So in the long term, Inequality may, will limit diversity and innovation it creates. So, for example, a diverse business team is more able to identify market niches. It can understand the needs of society's minorities and target products to meet those needs. Another thing here is that capitalism ignores external costs such as pol pollution and climate change. This makes goods cheaper and more accessible in the long run. But over time, it depletes our natural resources, lowers the quality of life in the affected areas, and increases costs for everyone. The government should impose uh, Pigovian taxes to monetize these external costs and improve the general welfare. Okay, so going now to the capitalism and private property. So private property rights are very important in capitalism. Most modern concepts of private property stem from John Locke's theory of homesteading, in which human beings claim ownership through mixing their labor with unclaimed resources. Once owned, the only legitimate means of transferring property are through trade, gifts, inheritance, or wages. The next one is that private property promotes efficiency by giving the owner of resources an incentive to maximize its value. 
The more valuable a resource, the more trading power it provides the owner. So in a capitalist system, the person who owns property is entitled to any value associated with the property. Okay, next one is that when property is not privately owned but shared by the public, the market failure can emerge, known as the tragedy of the commons. So the fruit of any labor performed with a public asset does not belong to the laborer, but is diffused among many people. So, there's a disconnect between labor and value, creating a dis, uh, disincentive to increase value or production. People are incentivized to wait for someone else to do the hard work and then swoop in to reap the benefits without much uh, personal expense. Okay, so con uh, disconnect between labor and value. Okay, next one is that a system must exist that protects their legal right to own or transfer the private property. So to facilitate and enforce pri private property rights, capitalist societies tend to rely on contracts, fair dealing, and tort law. Okay, for our assignment, so you have to elaborate Ka Eric's six point confessions at the first Senate hearing uh, at the uh, concerning about the red tagging of the Makabayan block and the CPP, NPA, and the F uh, uh, group. Okay, so that's all. Uh, please don't forget to uh, like, share, and subscribe to my YouTube page for more videos. So once again, I'm Sean Xavier Alcalita, now signing off.